to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our HFES 2018 coverage. My name is Nick Rome. I'm joined by Blake Arnsdorf, and we're here today with Dr. Micah Ensley. Micah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Nick. Happy to be here. So, Micah, I want to jump into a couple different topics today. I want to catch our listeners up on kind of where uh, your research has been in the past and then kind of what you're doing today at, at the um, Government Relations Committee and, and really focus on that because I think that's a sort of really important role that you're taking. Um, so could you just kind of describe your research and, and uh, how you got started and got into the field and what your research topics are? Well, I got into human factors because I was a um, undergraduate in industrial engineering, and I had a course in human factors with Dr. Mo Ayub, and really got intrigued by the whole idea that how we design technology could affect how well human people performed in a system. I thought that was just a fascinating idea. So I went uh, and did graduate work at uh, Purdue and then at the University of Southern California to get my doctorate. Um, I was working full-time through all of those jobs and uh, was at uh, Northrop Aircraft in California while I was at USC. Uh, uh, so I was able to uh, go to school part-time while, while right. I afforded to, to, uh, <laughs> to live there. Um, and I got really fascinated by the, the problems that we were having in, with situation awareness in designing fighter aircraft. I was at the time working on a, a project called Pilots Associate, where we were looking at uh, developing the first AI systems to go into cockpits. And I was the human factors uh, lead in that area. And at the same time, I had to come up with a dissertation topic. And I, I uh, thought, well, th- the problem with, it, with automation is that they get, we get this out-of-loop problem. And I hypothesized it was due to problems with situation awareness. Uh, so that led me into this whole issue of having to find it and having to figure out how to measure it. And uh, then my whole career has really been spent on, on this idea of situation awareness and how it affects people uh, or how people are affected by automation and how that affects their situation awareness. So it's, it's formed a whole career. So I have to ask, and this is because I hear it both ways, situation awareness, situational awareness. I want to hear it straight from the source. All right. Okay. You'll see it both ways out there in the literature, and they're really used interchangeably. Sure. Um, I, I once asked a, a grammarian, which is correct, and he told me situation awareness. He said situational awareness means uh, awareness that just happens sometimes. Situation awareness means awareness of the situation. There so we go. So we, that's, we <laughs> that's what I think is proper, but you'll see both used. We got the answer. We said it straight. There you so go. So I want to know kind of how um, you transitioned into your role as uh, the government chair, government relations committee, um, and, and what that is. Okay. Well, I um, during my career, I, I, I did a lot of different things. So I was in, in uh, industry for quite a while. I was in academia, uh, and then I started a small business. In 2013, I was asked to go serve as the Chief Scientist of the Air Force. And so I spent two years in the Pentagon advising the Secretary of the Air Force and the Chief of Staff of the Air Force on all matters science and technology, including human system integration. And when I left that position, um, the society asked me if I would take on this role as Government Relations Chair. Uh, When I had been President of the Society, we hired Lewis Burke Associates as our Government Relations Organization to give us some expertise in how to really uh, work with the government and influence what was going on in government activities to consider uh, the importance of human factors in ergonomics. So to me, it was a very natural role to go and, and work with Lewis Burke and uh, on the society's behalf to try and improve uh, the way in which the government views human factors in ergonomics and their consideration in their activities. How's that perception changed over time? Because I can only imagine that, like, with your very prestigious background that you have a lot of say and a lot of input, like, how has the reception been to trying to get, like, human factors and ergonomics more accepted in the government work? You know, it's, it's a long game. Sure. Um, there's a lot of people in the government, and those people change over. So you always really have to go and do education. And as you know, a lot of uh, people in society don't know much about human factors and ergonomics. And our elected representatives and staffers aren't any different. Many of them just have never heard of it. They don't know about it. They don't know why it's important. So a lot of my job is to uh, try to convey to them what what it is and and why it matters, Uh, the effect that it has on improving the technologies that we buy for our soldiers, for instance, and trying to reduce things like fratricide 
and, and deaths among our soldiers. That's an important objective. They all want to save money. That's an important objective. So we try to translate what we do into things that they care about, uh, which is, is saving money and, and, and saving lives. Yeah, I was going to ask, so it seems like sometimes the education piece might not be enough. I know, at least in, in some literature, it suggests that maybe education doesn't necessarily equal change. And so to follow up on Blake's question about how is the perception changing, it sounds like really kind of getting at what's in it for me, for them, is is uh, is kind of the selling point, right? Right. I mean, obviously, they have to do it because they, they, th- they see value in it. And it can take a number of years. So Lewis Burke has been working with the FAA, for example, and then this year we see in the appropriations bill a number of things are coming out that are saying the importance of, in- of, think- of including human factors in uh, the uh, modernization efforts that are going on because we want them to be smart consumers. And they're realizing that including human factors makes a huge difference in getting technology that's going to work well for the people who are using it, and it's going to save them money in operating costs. Uh, so it, it, it does pay off, it, but it can, t- it can take a number of visits uh, right. to go and, and have those conversations. Uh, th- there are a lot of issues that come up that have human factors relevance that we're finding out about. Uh, so, you know, a few years ago th- there was a, a bill that came out and they were thinking of changing the uh, experience hours that were required for commercial airline pilots uh, and dro- decreasing them Sure. because there's, there's a pilot shortage. And so we had to look at our science base and say, what science do we have that supports the, the value of expertise and the value of experience level for hiring decisions? So we try to contribute that, that kind of information. Uh, in another example, right now there's a, a bill in front of Congress to uh, change the regulations associated with uh, safety regulations associated with cars so they can push out autonomous, dr- autonomous vehicles more quickly into the road system, uh, which we have some concerns about that. So right. we've you know, summarized our research base and translated that into not just here's the research, but here's what it means for policy and what we think are appropriate policies. And we've just passed our first ever... Uh, policy, HFES policy on autonomous vehicles uh, that says these are things that have to happen, things like appropriate testing and designing the interface to support human, auto- human automation interaction uh, and, and, and those sorts of things. So it, it provides the uh, people on Capitol Hill with actionable information based on solid human factors and ergonomic science. And that's what we're trying to do. That's great. So I, I'm curious on what the actual interactions look like. Are these meetings? Who are these meetings with? And, and um, is there a strategy involved with who you invite to these meetings if they are meetings or are they presentations? Right. So this is where Lewis Burke's expertise comes into play. Um, they are a government relations expert. They understand how these things all work. We're not experts in that. And they'll line up meetings for us with the, with the appropriate committees who are interested in hearing what, what we have to say as constituents. Um, and then we can go in and, and provide that information and explain it to them. Uh, a lot of times they, they, they're, they're interested, but they just don't know a lot about it. So we have to translate what we're doing into, into layman's terms that, uh, that make it accessible. That's kind of great that there's an intermediary to help you kind of get your foot in the right door. Because, I mean, you're already having, like you've talked about, you're having to talk about impact and also explain kind of what the overall human factors and ergonomics of systems can do for people right. and especially when you're talking about something like auto- autonomous vehicles where there is a big push i know to get them out and on the road i think it's even more important to make sure that right. policy reflects what you actually yeah. need to do they've been a big boost to the society um, none of us are experts in that and they they really know the ropes they also have their kind of ear on the ground there and have understand the nuances of what's happening and who we need to talk to um, so it, they've, they've been really invaluable Looking forward to the future, what kind of expanded role do you see HFES as an organization potentially playing in informing some potential bills in the future? Right. So we're, you know, we're a small society. Uh, our role is to uh, provide the science. Uh, really, it, it, we just want people to make informed decisions, and we want them to be able to incorporate appropriate po- um, procedures and policies so that HSI gets incorporated into the development of systems or into some of these kinds of regulations. Uh, we have seven subcommittees in different areas, aviation, healthcare, care, um, defense, 
uh, occupational safety and health, uh, environment. Uh, we're, we're really working across all of these def technical areas to determine what are some policies and, and appropriate interventions to really help HS, the practice of HSI and, and the consideration of important policies. So that's one of our uh, going forward activities. Sure. And just, just for our listeners that might not know what HSI is, can you just describe that process? Oh, human system integration. So human system integration is sort of the umbrella term that's used to incorporate uh, hum all human factors activities, uh, as well as things like safety and manpower and training that all need to be considered in the design and development of a system. It's kind of all encompassing, right? All encompassing, yes. Yep. Oh, keep going. No, uh, <laughs> honestly, I think, is there anything else that you want people to know about this committee? And um, if they want to get involved, is there any way for them to do so? So the way to, to find out more about what's going on is if you look at the HFES website, there is a section devoted to policy. And we've been active in, in posting uh, things about our activities there. They include these policy statements that I've just talked about. They're also, they also include uh, information about opportunities for HFES research uh, that, that, that come out from different government agencies. So there's really a lot of information there if people look uh, that may be valuable to them in their research. Okay. And this, is, this might just be to satisfy my own curiosity. Is, do we, when we recommend science, are we looking just from within the organization? Or are we looking to um, science that's published in other uh, journals as well? Really, it's, it's anything that's relevant to our knowledge and expertise. We don't go too far out and, and talk about physics or anything like that. But, sure. but anything that's relevant to understanding how humans perform and behave and how that needs to be applied to the design of these systems and technologies and uh, p policies that are coming out. Blake, did you have any other closing thoughts? So the one thing I did want to ask is, uh, Nick, I know you typically ask this one, so if I'm stepping on your toes, let go me know. No, no, no. But for our younger audience, they're looking for a lot of way, ways of how they could get their foot in the door into human factors and right. maybe just general advice about like career paths or getting started or if they wanted to work in a line of or an area of expertise like you do, applying like SA in a much higher context like working with the government, um, how could they get started? You know, there's so many different opportunities in so many different places. You know, some people are working in, in, in healthcare organizations, some people are working in government labs. Uh, to me, it's, it's just hard to narrow it down to pick one. But get involved in the Human Factors Society is always the, the advice I give because here you'll meet so many colleagues who are working in different areas. Uh, you'll have opportunities to learn about where all the job opportunities are if, if they're looking for jobs. Uh, and you'll find out that there are, there are things going on you never had any idea were going on. So get involved. Volunteer for the society. Uh, to me, HFES is, is, is your profession. You know, the thing you do from 8 to 5, that's your job. And that's great, but when you come here, this is about your profession. And this is about not only developing those relationships uh, that will last a lifetime uh, and, the, and understanding what, what each other's doing uh, and what those opportunities are, but it's also your opportunity to really grow our profession and to improve uh, the degree to which the world knows and understands about HFES and, and the kinds of activities that we do. So. I, I highly recommend that. Well, Dr. Thanks. Micah Ensley, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, I want to thank you on behalf of both of us and all of our listeners for sitting down with us and letting everybody know about the Government Relations Committee. So to the way we end this podcast is we say it depends because it depends on so many different variables. It depends on the human when it comes to human factors. So on the count of three, we'll just say it depends and we'll wrap this thing up. Three, two, one. It, it depends. depends.